Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about depth domain seismic data, pitfalls and possibilities. So first of all, a little bit about the basics of seismic. Now, seismic uh, data is uh, our images of the subsurface produced using sound waves. Now, sound waves are sent down from a source, get reflected off an interface in a subsurface between two different types of rock, get bounced back up to the surface, where then they're recorded by the instruments such as geophones or hydrophones. All of that is put through a complex set of mathematical processing and out comes an image. Now, the image, however, is normally in the time domain, i.e. two-way time, seconds taken for the wave to go back down, to go down, and then to go back up again. And you then depth convert those particular resultant interpretations to produce depth maps, which you use for planning wells, calculating reserves, evaluating your prospects, etc. But you can also produce images in the depth domain. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And it's obviously really kind of convenient to have feet or meters on the side. There are no distortions due to various velocity factors. Also kind of looks, you know, looks right. And you can make decisions out of that. And there are two basic ways of doing it. One of which is depth stretch. So what you do there is you take your time domain data you then subdivide it into different layers of roughly equal types of velocity. You then uh, effectively scale those layers using the velocities to produce an image that uh, comes out of depth. Now, that's not always that accurate, uh, but some people do it and some people like it. I don't. And then there's depth migrated seismic, which adds a lot more value. Now, seismic migration is basically a way of processing your data to position the uh, reflections in the right place. And initially, when migration first developed back in the 1960s, 1970s, you used to do everything post stack and you used to do everything in a time domain. So that's kind of OK, but not that accurate. There are various distortions used ray paths, etc. So you can move into the pre-stack domain. So that's you migrate before you, you gather, before you stack, then you stack your gather and then you proceed forward. Or you migrate in the depth domain. Initially, you used to do things in post stack. So you have post-stack depth migration. But again, that's kind of a little more accurate than, than time migration, but still not altogether there. So you then move into pre-stack, which gives you the most accurate positioning. And initially, used algorithms uh, called Kirchhoff algorithms, and later use more advanced algorithms, you know, uh, wave equation, RTM, etc. And I'll explain a little bit about what those are later. Um, the key thing here is the more complicated your migration algorithm, the more it costs in terms of computer time and the more it longer it takes. Now, quite often you would need to produce data, first of all, in this domain to produce a more detailed velocity model to produce uh, data using these domains. So a little bit of a history in depth migration. So back in the 1990s, when I first started, you had post stack depth migration. It was isotropic. Uh, meaning that um, you would use a constant set of velocities with take, without taking anisotropy into account. And the velocities were always 105 to 110% too deep. So you correct for that using uh, either bulk stretch or bulk squeeze and um, to try to avoid distortions, but it wasn't really that satisfactory. Then in 1990, late 1990s, early 2000s, you had isotropic pre-stack depth migration. That became more of the standard. Uh, again, it had the same problems that you would have with isotropic. And then in the early 2010, uh, 2000s, uh, 2005 onwards, you had anisotropic pre-stack depth migration. Now, the reason you have anisotropy is because horizontal velocities, because velocity as a vector, are somewhat faster than vertical velocities. So this is an example of a cliff uh, in Dorset, England, uh, with uh, bands of uh, hard sandstones and soft sandstones. And basically, the velocities in horizontal domain are going to be faster than the velocity in the vertical domain. Now, in the late 2010s, uh, early 2020s, anisotropic depth migration is pretty much standard. You're now moving to the more advanced algorithms. And you're also doing full waveform inversion, which produces really detailed velocity models. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So velocity swimming depthing now this is based on a paper back in 2002 by etris uh, nick crabtree and Dua, and you had different velocities for different purposes now imaging when you're building a, a, a model for migration 
it's to get the right image, to get it in the right place, spatially as few distortions as little noise, to get an interpretable data set, basically. Whereas depth thing, to give, it gives you a realistic Earth model for calculating volumes and planning wells. So sometimes you would um, uh, traditionally put your pre-stack depth migration volume squeeze back into time using the velocity model used for migration. You'll interpret it in time domain, and then you'll depth convert using its whole different set of velocities, which uh, you know took its time and took some people getting used to. But that's how that's the old paradigm from the early 2000s. So a little bit about the different algorithms that are used in uh, in uh, pre-stack depth migration. You got ray paths, so that's Kirchhoff, which is 90 percent of um, uh, depth migration since then because it tends to be the cheapest and the fastest. Then you've got um, images by depth slice using finite difference. So they would use wave equations with all of these FD, FKs, etc. That's somewhat less popular, uh, but again, it's slightly, it's uh, longer t um, in terms of duration and more expensive than Kirchhoff, but nowhere near as expensive or as complicated as reverse time migration, which is two wave wave failed extrapolation. So you do imaging by the whole volume, which takes a long time, long compute intensity. So a little bit of a um, table showing all the different algorithms. So Kirchhoff is a standard, average speed, average uh, accuracy, pretty good amplitude preservation. So if you're in an amplitude derived play, you, you're in a good place to go. You know, fairly cost effective and about 90% of pre-SDM data sets. Fast beam, uh, less popular. Well, it's fast, uh, but it doesn't do very good for your amplitude. So if you're an amplitude derived play, you really don't want to be there. Then you've got Gaussian beam, which is rarely used. Again, slower than Kirchhoff, uh, more expensive than Kirchhoff, but uh, ha still has good amplitude preservation, but better accuracy. Wave equation, tend to use that for complicated model, but it's slow. It's uh, has poor amplitude preservation and it's expensive. And RTM, reverse star migration, that's the slowest, the most expensive. It had had poor amplitude preservation, but the algorithms are getting better. And it's expensive, but getting cheaper. But you only really use that for complicated geological setting. So here's an example that uh, Searcher Seismic put on the social media profiles uh, from the data that they've got in Mexico. So this is a big salt dome. And you've got some bright amplitudes here that are potential targets. Uh, you can see a flat spot, you can see a phase change. So this is Kirchhoff. You can see it's much higher frequency, but also quite a bit noisier. But again, is the salt dome image in the right place? With the um, RTM, more expensive, you can see the frequency is a bit lower, a lot less noise. Perhaps a little bit less definition on the bright events here than the Kirchhoff. Uh, but the positioning is much better. Key is do both, use both for the right purposes. So a little bit about full waveform inversion. Now, full waveform inversion is a way of building a really detailed velocity model using the data that's available. So what you do is you have um, an initial velocity model, which you then compare with actual data, and you continue iteratively modeling your velocity model using tomography until it starts matching the actual data. And when you have that, the velocity model is relatively correct. So this is an example here of an input velocity model. You can see it's just gentle uh, increase in velocity with depth due to compaction. And you can see the out. So this is from a paper by Han, Han and Hull. So initial model with a wavelet gives you a model short gather. You compare that with a quiet short gather. Look at the residual and keep altering the model shot gather using the velocity model until it matches as closely as possible the quiet shot gather. And then the velocity model gives you that fine amount of detail. Sounds great. When you have that, you're really in a good place. And this has only really come out in the last six, seven years. Key thing is you need long offsets, deep toe to get the extra data that you need to be, have required to make the tomography. So this is PGS's view, PGS and major geophysical contractor that's taken from the website. So velocities before full waveform inversion. Okay, relatively simplistic. You can see a little bit of velocity inversion here. And you can see after FWI. And you can see what is important here is quite a lot of these shallow channels, which could be drilling hazards, uh, which you need to identify. And again, starting model, uh, synthetic data, compare with raw data, keep updating your model, 
tilde two match. So that's all really great. So what are the pitfalls of depth uh, domain? Well, people like working in depth domain. It just feels natural, it's more natural than time. And also can be a shortcut in the interpretation process because you don't have to go through the depth conversion rigmarole. You just interpret, make maps, here you have it. Now, many contractors would sell data, uh, particularly non-exclusive data, speculative data in both time and depth domain. So they'll just give you a set of products. And a key point here is the velocity model will be created by the contractor. Now the contractors may well be focusing on imaging rather than depth things. So we saw a slide earlier on Crabtree et al about velocities used for imaging to make the best image possible, to get it looking right, get it in roughly the right place. But this isn't quite what you need to do with to get to depth uh, for depth conversion to produce depth products. There's also quite a lot less interpretation experience within processing houses because they focus on processing. That's what they're really good at. They might not have the knowledge of the regional geology or awareness of what the operator actually wants to solve. They want to produce something that, that looks right to them, but that may not necessarily be what would look right to an operating geophysicist working for an operator interpreting to make a decision on drilling a well. Now, you can have a situation where poor velocity model will lead to the creation of false structures. Now I've been in a situation, I know of a situation where that has actually happened. So you need to check if time and data align. Do people do that? If people only ever look at the depth domain, they don't know. And old geophysicists, and let's be honest, I'm an older geophysicist, uh, the people who grew up during the time of um, isotropic uh, depth domain data have a bit of a prejudice against working in, in depth domain because the data they used to work with, uh, the post post stack depth migration and the, ana and the isotropic pre stack depth migration, didn't get depths in the right place. So you would traditionally work in time domain data from those products and then depth convert. And you will also take the uncertainty of depth conversion to, into account. And I've got a video on stochastic and depth conversion and how that uncertainty can be handled, which you cannot do with depth domain data because it gives you one answer. So the key point here is who's built the velocity model and how? If you work closely with the processing house to build the velocity model as an interpreter, that's great. If you've got a full waveform inverted uh, velocity model, that's even better. But if it's an older data set and you don't know where it's come from and you don't know who's made it and you don't know why they made it, be very aware. So just because the vertical scales in meters doesn't mean that it's exactly true. And that's quite a difficult thing for many people to, um, to fully grasp. And early depth migration volumes didn't take anisotropy into account. So the depth was not accurate. Now the image was, and people were fine with that, but they knew how to correct for that. But people who haven't grown up with that may not necessarily do so. The newer data sets are anisotropic, so they fit the depth quite well, but even then you'll still get surprises because it's a model. But the FWI has really changed the game because it gives you geological insights based on an iterative model but you need modern data with long offsets, low frequencies. So the data before, let's say 2014, that didn't really exist. If you've got modern data, that's great. Got all the data, sorry. So the key point here, the absolute key point is to know how and by whom the depth seismic was generated. Very recent data is fine, but older data, please be aware of it. So if you want to know more about this, please contact me and I'm happy to help you. Please like and subscribe to this video and I'll see you on the next one.